The rabbit is one of Australia's serious rural problems. It has been a curse in every district wherever it has secured a foothold. It has defied the most strenuous efforts of control and destruction, always because enough have survived to provide a nucleus for a fresh outbreak when good seasons returned or when the control measures were relaxed. Heck Bradley realized this grim and unpleasant fact when he noticed that the rabbit population was building up on his property. He was a farmer who carried along the endless toil of rabbit eradication year after year, killing hundreds on his property, but never planning a serious effort to stamp out the pest once and for all. He saw clearly now, as he walked around his property, that his fences and gates were not as well maintained as they could have been, that the rabbits had increased in number. The fact was, he had relied too much on myxomatosis to wipe out all the rabbits on his and his neighbors' properties. Clearly, it was high time to intensify his activities, to rid the property of this pest before all the pasture was completely ruined. Heck Bradley was not the first farmer in the district to see the danger of another rabbit infestation and to seek the advice of the local lands department inspector. Two farmers from his own neighborhood were already there preparing to move out to clean up an area from whence rabbits repeatedly spread out to reinfest their lands. They were taking along some equipment they had hired from the lands department and the inspector was going to help them plan the campaign. They agreed that Bradley should look over this area and follow the eradication program as it was put into practice. This was the heavily infested area as Heck Bradley first saw it. It was a 250 acre paddock owned by one of the other farmers, a rabbit breeding ground not far from his own property. A survey of the paddock revealed that rabbits had bred up to a population of between five and six thousand. Here the pest was firmly entrenched in rocky outcrops along the crest of the hill. In this area, all the better grasses had been eaten out and noxious weeds such as nettles, thistles and inkweed were now growing. There were warrens on the hill slopes and under top cover such as dense tussock grass. Excessive grazing by the rabbits depleted surface cover. Water runoff increased. It sluiced down through burrows on the hillside, producing tunnel erosion, later developing into gully. Warrens scarred the open country and around trees and stumps. There were shelters in logs and warrens extended under cover of box thorns. Rabbit grazing had been followed by sheet erosion too. Instead of pasture, much of the area was bare ground. Capeweed had spread extensively on the hilly slopes. All the grasses and clover had been eaten out. The only plants to survive close cropping by the rabbits were weeds of poor grazing quality. The land was barely able to carry one sheep to five acres. The eradication plan outlined by the district inspector for cleaning up the paddock was of special interest to Heck Bradley. In another few weeks, he would have to tackle the job himself on his own property. A close look at an actual layout of the property showed difficult rocky outcrops along the top of the hill. Warrens on the open country plateau and along the hillside. And warrens on the flat area below the hill. The campaign started with the inspector proposing a thorough check over the property to ensure that all fences and gates were effectively netted. He emphasized that this is the only way to exclude rabbits completely and protect the property. The next step is poisoning. Trails of freshly turned earth will be run between feeding grounds and warrens and around patches of cover so that free feeds can be laid before the actual poisoning. Poisoning, when properly carried out, is a quick and effective method of destruction. It reduces the infestation so that other work, such as fumigation and ripping, may be carried out with greater success. After all fences and gates have been checked, the plan is got underway. First, by reconnoitering the area to be poisoned, in order to make an estimate of the length of trail and the quantity of fruit or other material needed for bait. Care should be taken to avoid disturbing the rabbits before and during poisoning, 
Therefore, all dogging operations, shooting and trapping must be suspended. Of course, stock must be removed from the area and poison notices placed at strategic points over the property and on adjoining properties when cooperative poisoning is planned. As rabbits are attracted to newly turned earth, the furrow should run between the rabbit harbour and the feeding grounds, so the rabbits will come across the trail when they move out to feed in the evening. This implement has been improvised to suit the hilly nature of the country. In fact, any implement can be used which will cut an even open furrow so that baits may be easily seen by the rabbits. Laying the trail in the right places ensures that the greatest number of rabbits will feed on it. On hill slopes, it is important to remember that trails must be made as close as possible to the contour to minimize erosion hazards. Furrows are cut around warrens, across rabbit pads and runs, through feeding grounds, and between harbour and feeding grounds. The difficulty of making a trail through rough areas and on steep grades inaccessible to a tractor is readily overcome by using this ring and setter. It can be drawn by one member of the team. A rather different problem exists in the rocky stretch at the top end of the paddock. This is a rabbit stronghold and must not be overlooked. Here a hand setter is used to turn over patches of soil in between the rocks. There is no time of the year, wet or dry, when rabbits cannot be induced to take some form of bait. They will always take apples or carrots, provided care is taken in the preparation and provided the material used for the bait is good quality. Several types of bait cutters are available. Here an inspector demonstrates a simple mechanical type. The accepted practice when using apples or carrots is to free feed the rabbits for at least three nights. This gets them accustomed to coming to the trail to feed. The quantity of bait required for the first night is based on the nature of the rabbit infestation. The inspector has reckoned the first application at one kerosene tin to the mile. This is done in the afternoon so that baits will remain fresh and tempting. The rate of application on the second and third nights is determined by the amount left on the trail after the previous feed. If, for instance, all the free feed has been eaten on the first night, the amount should be doubled on the second night. Where there is still some left on the trail, the amount need not be increased. On the third night, increase the quantity of feed in those parts where it was all eaten out on the other nights. Another farmer in the district is using a vehicle equipped with a trail maker. The free feed, oats in this case, can be fed at the same time. 1080 is the poison in general use for rabbit control, although strychnine is still used in certain circumstances. The bait is prepared in the same way as for free feeding. Health regulations which govern the use of 1080 poison stipulate that rubber gloves must be worn when handling the material. One fluid ounce of 1080 is sufficient to treat a kerosene tin of bait. The 1080 is mixed with water and is then ready for use. Special precautions are necessary for mixing the poison with the bait. An area of soil must be dug out and the mixing carried out on this area. A very small charge is made by the department for the supply of 1080 to landholders. In all cases, the lands department officer, who is authorised under the health regulations, is the only person to actually handle the poison. Thorough mixing of the bait is essential if good results are to be obtained. After mixing, the container must be carefully washed out on the prepared site. Finally, the soil must be replaced to avoid any risk to farm animals and wildlife. Rubber gloves must again be worn when laying the poisoned bait on the trail. Remember to spread the baits more plentifully in those sections of the trail where the free feeds were taken most readily. Notices should be displayed in prominent positions. 
This simple technique of poisoning can be carried out at any time of the year, irrespective of the season and of the available food supply. But there is a special advantage in poisoning during the breeding season, because then the unborn rabbits will be killed as well. Each doe can produce several litters each year, and does can begin to breed when they're 16 weeks old. This means that a mere hundred breeding does killed in the winter and spring is as good as killing thousands of rabbits in the summer months. There are two points to be observed after using 1080. All baits that remain should be destroyed and all dead rabbits collected and then burned or buried. However successful the poisoning, there are always some rabbits left to breed again, so poisoning should be followed by fumigation. But before fumigation is carried out, it is essential to eliminate all top cover which may provide surface shelter for rabbits. If this is not done before fumigation begins, loose rabbits are left on the surface to open up sealed burrows. Therefore, the area to be fumigated should be worked thoroughly with a dog pack to kill surface rabbits or drive them underground. Heck Bradley's dog joined in the work of chasing down loose rabbits when Heck came over to the paddock to follow the progress of the work. He arrived in time to see box thorns pulled out to reveal warrens extending under their roots. Thistles hiding burrows and shelters in hollow logs. Dead trees and stumps concealing entrances to warrens. Low scrub and tussocks were removed by firing, which was permissible at this time of the year. Now with all surface cover removed and the area thoroughly dogged, the inspector outlines his plan for treating the area with fumigants. Having equipment readily available, he is able to demonstrate three methods of fumigation. The rocky areas will be treated with chloropicrin. Flame fumigation is to be used for the warrens on top of the rise and on the hill slopes. Calcium cyanide dust and the blower unit will be used on the flats. When fumigation has advanced on a wide front past the worst rocky area, this area will then be netted off, sprayed with arsenic pentoxide to kill all plant growth and the rabbits left to starve. In other rocky areas, the fight is all on the side of the rabbit, as it shelters in a multitude of short burrows, in hollows under tree stumps and in rocky crevices. Chloropicrin is useful in such places. It can be easily squirted into burrows and crevices and is very toxic to rabbits. In most situations, chloropicrin can be used with complete safety, but in certain places, such as among rocks or on steep creek banks, it is advisable to wear an ordinary gas mask. Complete blocking of an opening is essential, as in all methods of fumigation. Chloropicrin can be used effectively in almost any area, and is particularly useful for checking over treated warrens to deal with any fresh opening. The fumigation campaign now moves to the open country, working on a wide front away from the rocky area. Here the warrens are mostly covered with nettles and thistles. No opening is to be left untreated and the whole area is flagged in advance of the fumigation unit. The direction of the wind determines which side of the warren to work from. The main opening is selected on the outer perimeter where the team can work with its back to the wind. The opening is first dug back to a solid face and the fumigator is placed in position. The killing agent is phosgene gas, which is generated when drops of carbon tetrachloride decompose in the heat of the flame. As smoke emerges from connected openings, they are broken down and filled in. Usually a thin crust of surface earth extends over the entrance to a burrow. If this is not dug back to solid ground, the crust may be broken and rabbits will escape. Also, it makes it easy for loose rabbits to reopen the warren. Another important aspect of digging back is to determine whether there is another run with the one being treated. The connected opening from which smoke emerges must be properly sealed. The other opening is then dug back ready for treatment. When this method is adopted, every burrow is certain to receive the maximum concentration of gas.
Work is completed only when every opening has been sealed and when the entire surface has been leveled off. The portable blower unit employing calcium cyanide dust can also be used successfully. Here again it is necessary to choose an opening on the windward side of the warren. This fumigant has the advantage that it continues to produce deadly gas up to 24 hours after the dust has been blown in. The procedure for digging back and filling in is the same, no matter what fumigant is used. It is essential to inspect the warrens the next day. Fresh openings can be treated with an ounce of flake calcium cyanide deposited well down the burrow, which is again sealed and leveled off. Ripping follows fumigation. This is necessary to destroy the structure of the warrens. As the inspector explained, fumigation is carried out before ripping because warrens are often constructed in two or even three layers. Ripping will destroy the upper two or three feet of warren structure, but unless the warren is fumigated before ripping, rabbit sheltering in the lower layers will be unharmed and will reopen the warren. In ripping, it is good to remember that there are usually runouts from the main burrow which end just below the surface. Consequently, the ripping should start about 10 feet outside the surface perimeter of the warren. First, rip up and down the slope using a single or double tined implement. At each end, the ripper is lifted out before turning for the next run. Each rip should be about 18 inches apart, working progressively across the warren until the overlap of 10 feet is reached on the other side. The warren is then cross-ripped, adopting the same procedure, but keeping as close as possible to the contour. Tunneling is treated in much the same way. Rip up and down the slope first to break in the tunnel structure, and then cross-rip along the contour, but in this case only two rips to the chain are made across the tunnel. Soil conservation authorities will give advice on problems of tunnelling and gullying. Heck Bradley was convinced that rabbit eradication pays, and pays handsomely when it has been diligently carried out. This is how his neighbour's paddock looked only three months after rabbits had been completely eliminated. In the absence of rabbits, the natural grasses had regenerated and were flourishing. There was now good cover of wallaby grass, kangaroo grass and sub-clover. This land, which had barely carried one sheep to five acres under rabbits, was now capable of carrying one to one and a half sheep to the acre without further pasture improvement. The cost of an eradication campaign such as this in a heavily infested area is fully repaid by increased returns in one year. And so Heck Bradley set to work in a campaign of simultaneous action with a group of neighbours to rid his area of rabbits. It began first with a thorough check over all fences and gates to see that they were properly netted. New netting was erected where necessary. Then poisoning to reduce the heavy infestation so that the work to follow might be carried out more effectively. Clearing to remove all top cover which harboured and protected rabbits. Dogging to kill surface rabbits or drive them underground. Fumigating and sealing all warrens and openings. Ripping to destroy the structure of the warrens. And finally, harrowing the ripped warrens and sowing them down to pasture. Once the rabbits have been eradicated, the land must be kept free of the pest by giving proper attention to fences and gates combined with regular patrols of the properties and a will to wage war on rabbits when and wherever they reappear. <laughs>